Audhu Billahi Minash Shaitani Rajeem Bismillahi Rahmani Rahim. I start in the name of Allah the Beneficent and the Merciful. I seek salvation from Shaitan the Accursed. My dearest viewers, my brothers and sisters from across the world, Assalamu Alaikum Jamian wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. May the peace and blessings and the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with you at all times. I would like to welcome you to another episode of the Ramadan show here exclusively on Imam Hussein TV with me, your host, Dr. Shabir Tijani. Inshallah, I hope that this can be a one-stop shop for the holy month. I would like to ask you to please send in your videos and pictures from how you are preparing for this holy month, as well as joining us on Twitter by using the hashtag IHTVRamadan and also joining us on Facebook, Instagram and on YouTube. Before moving on to the show, I want to just remember a saying and today because a lot of the show is in remembrance of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, I want to do one, a saying from his life. Imam al Hussein says, he says, a beggar stakes his prestige by asking, don't stain your personality by refusing him. Imam Hussein here talks about how the dignity of someone who's begging is lowered because they're asking you for something. Do not turn away from them. Always give to the needy, always give to the poor. Inshallah, if we can do that, we'll achieve closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this episode on spiritual refinement, inshallah I want to discuss and talk about a specific journey, a journey for a human being physically but also spiritually. It's a journey that is unlike any other. For those of you who haven't done it, I urge you to do so. And that is none other than the ziyarah of Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam in Karbala. The merits of this ziyarah are unfathomable, unconceivable. When you read about them in a hadith, you realize what the station of this great individual, this great personality is. Inshallah, over the next few minutes, I just want to talk firstly about my experiences on Ziyara. And secondly, what happens to you when you get to Ziyara, when you get to the land of Karbala? What feelings you have, what emotions go through your mind and through your heart? And then Inshallah, I will end by talking about the Hadith and the merits of this great Ziyara. Alhamdulillah, I've been granted the opportunity to go three times now on Ziyara and each time is very different. The Imams, they call you for a specific reason. We often say to the Imams, please accept our Ziyara, but whenever I've been, I've never said that because I know for a fact that just making the intention of going, just going to that place, to the people that are the givers of all givers, how could they not accept the Ziyara? When Imam Hussein wants to see his loved one, he calls you towards him. Sometimes we feel ourselves unworthy of the ziyara, But don't forget, just as much as you want to see them, they want to also see you too. The love that they have for their followers, for their Shia, is something that you or I won't be able to understand. It's inconceivable because when we think back to the day of Ashura in 61 AH, we see Imam Hussein laid down everything he had. He laid down his life, the life of his children, the safety of his family, just so that he can give us the gift of humanity, so that he can give us the gift of freedom. Imam Hussein loves us so much. And because of this great sacrifice he gave, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given down a whole community. And that community is us, the Shia. Our station is so elevated that we are the community that was promised to Lady Fatima by her father, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The journey of Ziyara is one that is very special from the moment you leave your home. Inshallah, I'll talk about the ahadith and I'll talk about the merits of the journey itself a bit later on. But when you land or when you get to the land of Karbala, you realize where you are. The feel and the pull from the land is something that you will never experience before. 
You may see pictures, you may see videos, but until you've experienced what it's like to be in Karbala, you will never understand. For all of us, for those who love Hussein from the bottom of our hearts, from the moment we've heard about Hussein, our soul and our hearts have always been in Karbala. But once your body gets here and you're completely in one place, you realize exactly what Karbala is. You feel Karbala. You can hear Karbala. You can see Karbala. You can smell Karbala. It's like nothing that you will ever experience before. When you see the shrine of Imam Hussein for the first time, I guarantee you will break down. There is no other emotion that is quite like it. You remember every Masaib you've ever heard before. You realize what this great personality has given for you, has given for me, has given for all of us. He's given us complete freedom. He's given us the beauty of this world. He's given us this great religion of Islam. He's protected us from every negative trait possible. He's tried to guide us through his own actions. And after all of that, we cannot turn away from him. Our whole aim in life is to serve him. Inshallah, now I just want to talk a little bit about the merits of this great journey. I'm using a book that's called Kamil, Kamil Ziyarat, which is a very famous book about the merits of this great journey. So I'll just read some of the things from there. And inshallah, it will make you understand exactly where the station of the Zawars are. It is said when visiting Imam Hussein is the ultimate sign of love for the Ahlul Bayt It says when Allah intends goodness for a servant, He places the love of Imam Hussein and the love of visiting him in his heart. According to several traditions, ziyarah of Imam Hussein is the best deed. The Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, will embrace the visitors of Imam Hussein on the Day of Judgment. By performing the ziyarah, one, one has made or observed a relationship with the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, and all the guiding Imams. The requests of the pilgrim at his grave are fulfilled. His supplications are answered. And sooner or later, the pilgrim that is left will always be protected. If people know that Allah has placed in the visitation of the grave of Imam Hussein in terms of excellence, they would die of eagerness and their breath would stop with a sigh. Inshallah, I'll continue a bit later on about the merits. I just want to go on a little bit about Karbala in the physical terms, where it is, the problems that it faces, and why, despite all of these problems, people still continue to flood there. We know that Karbala lies in the south of the country of Iraq, and it's probably one of the most insecure countries in the world due to political unsteadiness. However, you see millions and millions of people year in, year out, that come to this holy shrine. Why? We see in the day of Arba'in, or during the time of Arba'in in fact, people do this great war from Najaf to Karbala, and it is estimated that over 20 million people have visited the shrine of Aba Abdullah al Hussein every Arba'in for the past two or three years. Why is that? It is because Aba Abdullah al Hussein is more than just a person. Obviously, he's a personality, and we know that he was a man, but because of his legacy, because of what he's left behind, he's become so much more than that. For people who have no hope, he's a beacon of hope. For those who are poor, he gives them a sense of belonging. For those who have no one in life, he gives them a place to go. An ark of salvation, that is what he's known as. Imam Hussein is more than just one person. Imam Hussein is the name of the ultimate revolution. Imam Hussein is the essence of our being. When we wake up in the morning, we think of him. As we go through our day, we think of him. When we sleep at night, the last thing we think of is of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. You see, the great station that is achieved is through that ultimate sacrifice. When you face any tribulations in life, you ask him for help, and the help is there. Whenever you have a time of joy, you think of him, and that joy is even more elevated. Aba Abdullah al Hussein never lets down his servants. And that is why this individual is revered so highly. 
He taught us that whenever you face times of trial and hardship, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And ultimately, the most important thing is whenever you see injustice, don't just sit down, make a stand against it. When he made that journey to Karbala, he knew what was coming up, but he knew that he had to make that journey and make that sacrifice to save all of humanity. And through that, he's taught us how to be. And that is why 20 million people every year stand up to all the oppressors, stand up to the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt, and they make a stand. And just by what they do, their actions, they're saying, La Baika Ya Hussein. So that is why so many millions of people come to the shrine. They don't have fear of their own lives. They don't have the fear of the lives of their family or their loved ones, because ultimately their goal is Hussein. And if they can die in his service, that is all the more worth it. Inshallah, I'll talk a bit more about the merits of, of this yara. The Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him. Lady Fatima al Zahra and the Imams pray to Allah for the forgiveness of those who visit the shrine of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. The angels pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the forgiveness of those who, who come to the shrine of Imam Hussein. They welcome their arrival and they accompany them during their departure. They visit their sick attend their funeral prayers whenever they die, they continue to pray for them even after their own death and open, them, open for them the gate of paradise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appointed approximately 70,000 angels around the blessed grave of Imam Hussain alayhi salam who stay there until the day of judgment and perform prayers. Each of their prayers is equal to a thousand prayers of a human being. The angels cover the pilgrims with their wings in such a way that they feel their presence and feel their blessings. For a single penny that one gives as charity during the ziyara or pays to accommodate the journey of a visitor, Allah should grant him 10,000 bounties. As per another hadith, Allah shall write for him in the good deeds to the extent of the Mount of Ahad and shall reimburse the money that he spent many fold. For each footsteps of one who goes on ziyara, Allah the Almighty writes a good deed for him and removes the sin from his record. When he reaches the sanctified shrine, Allah will write for him amongst the prosperous. On the day of judgment, the visitor of Hussein salam will be allowed to intercede for 100 people of their choice. Finally, I just want to talk about one other personality who's buried there by the shrine of Imam al-Hussein. And this is one personality that we shouldn't forget. And that is Abu Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. Why? Because Imam Hussein lives as the beacon for all of those who seek hope, as a beacon for all of those who seek salvation. But we see on the land of Karbala, his right hand was Abu Fadl. And during the times that he suffered, during the times where he had trials and tribulations, Abu Fadl would always stand up in front of him and he would protect him. We see that in Karbala today, Abu Fadl still stands by his brother. And it is as though in the eyes of the enemies of Islam, the shrine of Imam al-Hussein is still protected. It is said that when you visit the shrine of Hussein, before visiting the shrine of Hussein, you should always pay your respects to Abu Fadl. And it is said that when you visit the shrine of Abul Fadl, when you come to Karbala with the niyat of Ziyara, Abul Fadl protects you for three days. And that is the station of this great personality, that personality who picked up the water on the day of Ashura and he spilled it back into the river. Today the water still circumambulates his grave and it will continue to do so until the day of judgment. And inshallah, let's pray that we get the gift and the blessings of this ziyara. Let's pray that on the day of judgment, when we stand up, when we're resurrected, that the Imam calls us to him as one of his own.
The Holy Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and his progeny, has said, Eight Ramadan is the month whose beginning is mercy. Its middle is forgiveness and its end is emancipation or liberation from the hellfire. As we take our trip through the world, talking about how people prepare themselves for the month of Ramadan, their day-to-day -day lives, our journey takes us to a place called Quetta, which is found in the north of Pakistan. For those of you who don't know, it's probably one of the most infamous places now within the Shia world. The reason being, there have been so many thousands of innocent Shia lives, so many Shia blood that's been shed and spilt because the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt salam, hate the love that we show for the Ahlul Bayt. However, despite that, the people in that region still continue to go strong, still continue to proclaim their love for the Ahlul Bayt. Over the next few minutes, I just want to talk about how they get themselves ready for this month and how they go about their day-to-day -day lives. The day usually starts in the morning very early, usually around 3.30 at this time of the year. And it starts off with suhoor, usually something light to eat. So they have things like flatbread, they have some tea or some water and then they get ready to pray after which they recite some Quran and then go to sleep for a few hours after which they get up for school and for work they get about and they start their daily lives during this time the school hours are shortened and work hours are shortened also so that people can go home earlier on in the day firstly because they can avoid the harsh weathers that are there and secondly, because they can prepare themselves for the iftar and they can prepare themselves for the amal during the nights of Laylat al-Qadr. And they also prepare themselves for the majalis and for the dua. At iftar time, usually there is some light food to begin with, after which they have their main meal after a couple of hours. One of the main things about Quetta is that the people there, because it's, um, there is pockets of Shia population, they get together and they like to give food to the needy and to the poor. They have a very, very big sense of belonging to one big community. And wherever there's poor people in that, within that community, they're always fed, they're always invited to someone else's house in order for iftar to be served. After which, they all head to the mosque and they enjoy in majalis, they have dua and a'mal on the specific nights. One of the things about Quetta is that the government subsidizes a lot of food during the month of Ramadan, especially to the poor. Things like rice, flour, cooking oil is all given and subsidized by the government. One of the other things that the local community do is try to encourage young children to fast. So usually young children will fast maybe one or two days during this holy month. But the elders will make a big deal of it. They will give them gifts and they'll celebrate. This is one way of getting them ready for the years coming up when they reach adulthood. I would like to once again humbly ask you to send in your videos. Inshallah, we would like to air them to see how you spend your days during the month of Ramadan. We'd like to read your blogs. We'd, write, we'd like to see what you have to write. You can join us on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter and you can write things on there as well. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Dearest Imam Hussain TV viewers Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome to the holy city of Karbala Today we came to one of the store markets in the holy city of Karbala to show you the atmosphere of the holy month of Ramadan as we are getting closer and closer to the final days of the holy month of Ramadan <laughs> Dearest viewers, I have one of the brothers here. Let's have a word with him. Salam alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. 
میتونید در مورد حال هوای کربلا توی ماه مبارک رمضان برای ما یه توضیح بفرمایید بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم ماه رمضان تو کربلا یکی از قشنگ تر روزای زندگیمونه که اینجا انجام میدیم و ما رمضان خیلی گرمه اینجا ولی شبای قشنگی داره تو روزا معمولا همه مثلا استراحت میکنن تو خونه هم خواب هم ولی بعد از ظهر یا شب یا همون دم افتار بیاید بین اون حرم اینو که ببینید همه سفراشون رو پهم میکنن یا نفتاری میکنن تا نزدیک های سهر هم میمونن تو بین اون حرم یا حرم حال هوای خیلی خوبی داره Brother is saying that the holy month of Ramadan is totally different in the holy city of Karbala. Uh, due to the heat here in, in Iraq, uh, many visitors uh, try to stay at home during the, the day and usually they come out at night. Uh, before the dusk prayers and before the iftar, many visitors come to Bain al-Haramain and they prepare their iftar to eat their iftar here in Bain al-Haramain. And they stay here usually until the morning prayer and then they leave. خب میتونید در مورد کارتون در مورد ماه مبارک رمضان برای ما یه توضیح بدین؟ تو ماه مبارک رمضان به خاطر اینکه همه تا نزدیک سحر یا تا ازون صبح همه بیدارن و, و مشغول عدیه و زیارت و ارباب هستن به خاطر همین هم مثلا ما کارمون از مغرب تا از اون صبح تقریبا به خاطر همین روزا دیگه استراحت میکنیم تا بعد از ظهر از بعد از ظهر به بعد کارمون شروع میشه تا نزدیک افتار افتار هم میریم خونه بعد یه ساعتش میایم دوباره تا نزدیک از اون صبح I asked the brother about their working hour and he's saying that uh, because uh, everybody during the holy month of Ramadan is busy with, the, with doing the ziyara and the amal after the iftar uh, and usually people stay up until morning uh, therefore they, uh, they try to rest at home during the day and uh, before the iftar they, they come to their stores, they prepare their stores, they go home, do their iftar and then they come back here and uh, they stay open until the morning prayers. In this episode, as we talk about health tips and medical advice, I just want to change our focus very slightly away from talking about pathology, illnesses, how you can help yourself avoid getting sick, and talk more about the human body, about the beauty of our form, about the beauty of humankind. I want to talk about different systems, inshallah, from now on until the end of our series. So today I'm going to start off by talking about the nervous system. The nervous system includes the brain, the spinal cord and peripheral nerves. But if I was to talk about the nervous system in much detail, I could take all 30 episodes and I still wouldn't be complete. So inshallah, today I want to talk about very briefly about part one of the nervous system. Inshallah, tomorrow I'll talk about part two of the nervous system. Part one, I'm going to talk about the human brain. And part two, I'm going to talk more about the spinal column and peripheral nerves and exactly how they, how they work, how they function, how they adapt to the role they play. The brain consists of many lobes and many areas. The human brain in evolutionary terms is one of the most sophisticated, probably the most sophisticated organ known. The human brain consists of many lobes and each lobe has a defined function. They work together so that a human being is a human being. They have thought, they have processing, they have the ability to act on those processes. And that's what makes the human being. Inshallah, I'll talk about the different lobes, what function each lobe has, and exactly how that actually correlates in what we do in day-to-day -day life. The first part of the brain I want to talk about is called the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is probably one of the most interesting parts of the human brain 
because when we compare it to a lot of evolutionary, a lot of animal uh, brains, the frontal lobe is very well developed. The reason being is that the frontal lobe is in charge of thought processing, planning. It has roles to play in, in, in objectives and goals, setting plans, executive function. The frontal lobe is one of the most biggest and most profound evolutionary miracles. The frontal lobe allows you, number one, to plan what you're going to do, and number two, it stops you, inhibits you from doing things that you shouldn't do, things that, that are against the social norm, for example. And that's what's the beauty of this frontal lobe. The other things that the frontal lobe does is it takes sensory pathways to the rest of the brain. One of the oldest forms of these is called the olfactory nerve, which is from the nose. It's actually giving us the sense of smell. And our sense of smell goes to our frontal lobe rather than further back in the brain primarily. After that, I want to talk about the next lobe, which lies just behind the frontal lobe, and that is the parietal lobe. I feel that this is probably one of the most interesting parts of the brain because the parietal lobe is in charge of sensory perception. It has areas of the brain, the primary sen somatosensory cortex, which takes in information from the rest of the body, our touch, our feel, and it processes that so that we can respond to that and we can also plan and send messages to the frontal lobe so we can plan our next action. The parietal lobe also has the primary motor cortex which forms part of the great structure of our body which allows us to act and move. The sensory cortex senses something, it sends, it sends the messages to the frontal lobe and the frontal lobe sends the message to the motor cortex and that's what makes us do the actions that we do in reaction to the stimulus. It's a very very deep rooted and a profound part of the human brain, one which allows us to act and function. If there's any strokes which happen in this area of the brain, it can cause profound loss of movement or sensation on a particular part of the body. The next part of the body that I want to talk about is the occipital lobe, which is found at the back of the brain. That in itself is in charge of giving us our perception of sight. And the beauty of this is that it gives us the perception in a binocular or in a binocular way. So we can assess both sides of the eyes, so both eyes, and we form a full 3D picture. And as a result, we're able to act on that picture. And th simple things like driving without the, without the occipital lobe would be unable to do. And finally, it's the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe is found on the side of the brains, or sides of the brain. And what it does is it's primarily in charge of hearing. Apart from these four lobes of the brain, we also have something called the cerebellum. The cerebellum receives information from different parts of the body. It receives proprioception from the peripheral nerves. Proprioception is the ability of the, the joints in your hand to know which position they're in. And when you know that, you know which position your body is in. As a result, when this is fed back to the brain, you know where you are in time, uh, and space rather. The other reception of, for the cerebellum is from the ears and also from the eyes. And the cerebellum is mainly in charge of coordination. So when you do complex movements, the coordination is directed from the cerebellum. We find that people who take certain medications or alcohol, alcohol which actually causes suppression of the cerebellum. The first test that we find the police use is get them to walk in a straight line. Why? Because the first thing that alcohol wipes out is the cerebellum and therefore you cannot coordinate. People cannot walk in a straight line. The next part of the brain I want to talk about is the brain stem itself. The brainstem is probably one of the most important parts of our brain. The reason being is it has a lot of core functions. Core functions being the respiratory centers, the cardiovascular centers, the cardiac centers rather. It, it plays a huge role in regulating most of the parts of the body which are under involuntary control. And also it takes messages from the, what we call the cranial nerves, which are the nerves that are found around the face. Inshallah, I'll talk a little bit about those in a second. And this brain stem, if it's damaged in any way, can cause the end of life. Because if the respiratory centers are cut, your breathing will become very difficult and it may stop altogether. 
if other parts of the brainstem are affected, it may cause things like loss of uh, cardiac output if it, if it affects the um, cardiac centers. If it affects the, for example, the thermoregulatory centers, it will affect your ability to control your temperature and so forth. The next part of the human brain I want to talk about is probably not the brain itself, but the special senses. We have a few special senses which are so evolutionary or, or so profound, so progressive in terms of evolution that scientists cannot work out how to actually join it together with the theory of evolution. And those are the eyes and the ears. The eyes themselves are such a miracle that if I was to explain it to you, it would take me a very, very long time. But essentially, the eyes are formed of different layers and each layer has a particular role. On the surface of the eye, we have the cornea. The cornea protects the eye. It forms a layer on front of the eye. After that, you have your iris. The iris is made up of different muscles. And essentially, what they do is they contract and they relax in order to expand the pupil size and to relax the pupil size. The iris itself plays a very important role in that action. The reason why pupils, pupils need to change in size is because, for example, we, when we shine light into someone's eye, we look for the pupils to constrict. And that is a normal reaction or a reflex. The reason why they constrict is that the human being is designed in such a special way that when we get too much light that goes and hits the back of the retina, the eye responds by reducing the amount of light that enters it. Therefore, you get less, less problems with overexposure. Likewise, the other way around, when it's too dark, the pupil expands or becomes bigger. The reason being is that you want as much light to get to the retina so that you can make out objects in the dark. Then after that you have your pupil, which is basically just a hole. The pupil is the area through which the light passes, after which you get to the lens. The lens is a very, very important part of the eye, and that causes refraction, and it allows the light to be focused onto a particular point on the retina. The way that people become short-sighted or long-sighted is if the lens isn't functioning properly, if there's a, a slight miscorrection of the lens, and as a result the focus point is either in front or behind the retina itself. After that, you have your vitreous, which is the fluid in the eye, which keeps the eye structure. And then finally, you have your retina. Retina consists of many blood vessels. On it lie two particular types of cells called rod cells and cone cells. The rod cells give us the um, perception of light and dark. And the cone cells give us the perception of color. And all of these are very important when we talk about the human eye. After the, after the retina, the retina has many nerves and very small nerves and they feed into the main optic nerve and that goes into the brain and passes via a special part of the brain called the optic chiasma and makes its way to the occipital lobe that I described before. The human ear, once again, is very specially designed for its purpose. The ear itself is made of the inner and outer ear canal. The outer ear canal is the one that we can put our fingers inside when we put our fingers inside our ears and that then goes on to the eardrum when any sound is heard or if any sound is made, if there's any waves. They cause the eardrum to vibrate and move. This eardrum in turn has three bones behind it and the three bones actually vibrate in a specific way and then they go on to move the stapes which is the final bone and that connects the, uh, the, the cochlea which is inside the ear which allows the human being to hear certain things. If, again, if I was to talk about the ear and how it fun functions, we could be here all day. But essentially, that is how the ear works. And this is, I guess, two of the main special senses. When we talk about the sense of smell and taste, we talk about a very primitive process. It's via the olfactory nerve, which is one of the most primitive nerves or primitive special senses in the animal world. The olfactory nerve actually connects through to the frontal lobe of the brain and then it goes to the sensory components of the brain and it allows us to use all of our senses around us to make a whole picture, to perceive life, to perceive where we are. There are, we are often told in school and as we grow up that we have five special senses and we do. The final one is a sense of touch Inshallah, I'll talk more about it tomorrow when I discuss the peripheral nervous system. But we do have other very special senses. One of them is proprioception that I mentioned. Inshallah, I won't go into that too much, but 
it would be nice if you read up about them. There's a lot of very, very special designs within the human body, especially the nervous system, which makes us distinctive from any other animal that's out there. Inshallah, I hope that this session, this particular segment has been enlightening. And this has given you a very, very, very brief overview of what the brain does, what the human nervous system does, and the role it plays, how it's designed to perfection. Inshallah, if I had the time, I would expand further and talk about it for ages and ages because it's one of my favorite topics in the whole area of medicine. However, we don't have time for that. Inshallah, I hope that tomorrow you'll tune in and learn more about the nervous system where I talk about the spinal column and the spinal cord and also the peripheral nerves and the nervous system. And inshallah, I hope that as this month of Ramadan passes, we appreciate our bodies more and more. We appreciate the gift that God has given us so that inshallah, as we grow up, we can look after this gift, we can look after our bodies and grow up to be healthy people with a good quality of life so that we may serve the community and serve our Imam alayhi salam. During the time of Imam Musa al-Kadhim, peace be upon him, the seventh Imam of Ahlul Bayt, there was a rude and uneducated farmer who used to abuse Imam, Imam al-Kadhim every time he saw him. No matter how rude this man was, Imam Musa al-Kadhim never got angry and never said anything to that man. One day, the companions of the Imam were angered by this action and wanted to punish the man. But the Imam Musa al-Kadhim refused and this allowed them to. And he told them that he will teach this man a lesson. One day, Imam Musa al-Kadhim rode out to the rude man's farm where he saw him working. When, this, when the man saw Imam Musa al-Kadhim, he stopped working and put his hands on his hip and got ready to abuse the Imam. Imam Musa al-Kadhim dismounted from his horse, went towards the man and greeted him with a friendly and smiling face. Imam Musa al-Kadhim told him that he should not overwork himself and that his farm is very good. He then asked the man, how much do you expect for your crops? The farmer was amazed at Imam Musa al-Kadhim's politeness and sincerity. He waited a little and said, I am expecting around 200 gold pieces. Imam Musa al-Kadhim took out a purse and gave it to the man and said to him, here is 300 gold pieces and you can keep your money and keep, and keep the crops and hoped that the crops would get him more money. The farmer faced with such kind behavior and good manners, he was very ashamed of himself and asked forgiveness from the Imam. After that, whenever the farmer saw the Imam, he would approach him and greet him politely. The moral behind the story is that whenever we are treated bad by other people, we should respond by treating them with goodness, by treating them with sincerity, similar to what the Imam did and also give to the people even if they don't deserve it. Imam Ali, peace be upon him, says, be like the flower that gives its fragrance even to the hand that crushes it. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As we've talked about earlier in the show, the merits of the ziyarah of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. We see when we look around the world that the lovers of Hussein are being massacred in their thousands. From east to west, the enemies of Islam hate the lovers of Hussein. But it's our challenge to these people that no matter what you do, we will continue to proclaim Ya Hussein. We will continue to say, La Baika Ya Hussein until the moment that our breaths are taken away, until the moment that we die. You can blow us into pieces Just like glass shatters to shards Every drop of our blood will Light up the skies like the stars You can kill us and our children 
we will bear all of the scars. You will never stop our voices, cause Hussein lives in our hearts. You can try to do your worst, but all your efforts are in vain. If you stop our lips from moving, through our blood will write for say. Through our blood will write for say. You can bomb us, shoot us, kill us, but we'll never feel the pain. If you stop our lips from moving, through our blood will write for say. Through our blood will write for say. We are crying for the martyr who was stranded all alone. He was shrouded by the arrows. He was wounded by the stones. Then the enemy began to cut his neck right to the bone. As the heartbeat ebbed away his Name in history was sown. But remembering this image, our grief can't be contained. If you stop our lips from moving, through our blood we'll write for say. Through our blood we'll write for say. Being told about Hussein's fate, Fatima cried out aloud. Then the prophet then consoled her. As he wiped her tears, he vowed, There will come a special nation that will cry for him, no doubt. We are those chosen people that Muhammad spoke about. The facts will speak for themselves. None of history will change. If you stop our lips from moving, through our blood we'll write for say. Through our blood we'll write for say. You can bomb us, shoot us, kill us, but we'll never feel the pain. If you stop if you our stop lips our from lips moving, through our blood we'll write for say. Through our blood we'll write for say. Holy Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and his progeny, has said, It Ramadan is the month whose beginning is mercy, its middle is forgiveness, and its end is emancipation or liberation from the hellfire. I want to thank you once again for watching this show. This concludes this episode of the Ramadan show. Inshallah, I hope that you've gained a lot out of this. And I want to remind you once again to send in your videos, to send in your pictures, your blogs about how you're preparing for this holy month. Before concluding, I just wanted to leave you with a final thought, something to contemplate over. And that is that success always tastes sweeter after struggle. Sometimes we want something so bad, we don't want to work for it. However, when we do work for it, and we get it after the struggle, it always tastes better and it feels more satisfying. I would like to once again remind you to please join us on Twitter using the hashtag IHTVRamadan, on Facebook, Instagram, and on YouTube. I want to finally bid you farewell with the following words. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.